So now we're going to carry on with our Secrets of a Sun King. We're going to be reading chapter six and we're on part two. Now there's a little quote by Howard Carter here. It was for us to prove we were tr worthy of trust. Ooh. So let's have a look at chapter six. How long does it take to feed the cat? Dad quizzed me when I got home. I didn't have an answer ready this time either. As I took my coat off and warmed my hands by the stove, I was still in a daze. Though I'd expected the jar to be from Egypt, nothing had prepared me for Lysandra's story, which connected it to the most famous pharaoh in the whole world. I kept thinking about Kai Kai, the boy who wanted a normal life, who sounded nothing like the treasure-laden king Howard Carter was chasing after. And that uh, wasn't all. Professor Hanawati had been working on the rest of the translation when he died. In his letter, he promised more to come. Just the part I read threw up questions enough. Was the little rock-faced tomb Hanawati mentioned the same one Howard Carter was searching for? Was the site where the archaeologists and news reporters from far away were gathered really the right place? It didn't sound that peaceful to me, which brought me back to the curse. Howard Carter was the reason the curse was active again. It had to be. The news of his final search in the Valley of the Kings had broken just before Hanawati's letter arrived at Grandad's. In digging for the tomb, Mr Carter had stirred up the past. Saying I had a headache, I went to bed early, where I read Lysandra's account all over again. This time I noticed the uncanny links between her life and the present day. Kai Kai's fever, his cough, the insect bites, all sounded spookily like Grandad's malaria and infected lungs. Even the normal things that anyone could relate to, like the cold weather and worries about health and friendship, felt oddly apt. Yet, when I finally turned the light out, it wasn't, it wasn't the curse I was thinking about. It was the adults who pushed you into being something bigger than you wanted to be, and best friends and brothers, neither of which I had, but which would uh, probably make life a lot better. The next day, Tulip wasn't in school again. How she got away with it, I don't know. So at the end of the day, I headed to the Highgate. I headed to Highgate to fetch my satchel. From St Kilda's, it was half an hour walk to 24 Makepeace Avenue, which was the address written inside of her bag. Despite as uh, uh, desperate as I was to get the jar back, I was looking forward to seeing Tulip and Oz again. The road itself was lined with trees, so even before I saw number 24, I knew it was going to be posh. It was halfway along the street, and by crikey, it was fancy. I stopped at the gate for a moment, just to brush off any dirt off my coat. The house was made of brick with doors arched like a church. Even the windows were beautiful, topped with little panes of blue and red glass. It was all a bit intimidating, mind you. So, uh, mind you. So I took my uh, my school hat off before ringing the bell. Almost immediately, the door flung open and there was Tulip. I was suddenly worried she wouldn't remember who I was. Lil! she cried. Thank goodness you tracked us down! I was surprised and delighted at how pleased she was to see me. Come in! You're just in time for tea! Tulip uh, held the door wide open, waving me inside. I went in on my tiptoes, afraid of dirtying the floor, which was blue and white, as beautiful as dinner plates. Everything in the hallway looked expensive, dark, heavy furniture, gold-framed mirrors. There was even a telephone. Helping me out with my coat and dumping on the chair, Tulip took her own satchel from me. I need to talk to you, she hissed urgently. I was taken aback. Oh, all right. When we have tea, I'll give you a sign, she sounded excited too. By now, I guess she'd been snooping inside my satchel and knew about the jar. Instead of feeling miffed, I was rather relieved. There was a chance to actually talk to someone about it as long as she could keep a secret. Tulip took me into a parlour, where Miss, uh, Mrs Mendoza was sitting beside the fire writing. Without her hat, she looked younger, her uh, blonde uh, uh, and blonder, her hair fashionably bobbed. Mama, Tulip gasped, Lil's come to my rescue by bringing my bag back. Why, thank you, Lil. If only we'd had your address, we would have returned yours, Mrs Mendoza said, smiling. I was glad she didn't have it. Frankly, after seeing where the Mendozas lived, the thought of Tulip coming to my tiny flat made my tails curl with embarrassment. 
As Tulip was asked to call Oz down for tea, I was invited to sit on a plush velvet sofa that squeaked when I moved. I couldn't help gaze at all the paintings on the wall. Uh, slapdash scruffy ones that Dad would say a child had done, but which looked incredibly modern. With a fed-up sigh, Mrs Mendoza closed the notebook she'd been writing in and turned her attention to me. Editors are put on this earth to test us, Lil. I suppose an editor was someone in charge of writers, and replied, My mum works at Woolworths, and she says her boss is a cow. Really? says Mrs Mendoza's mouth twitched with a smile. Mr Pemberton, my editor, is over here from the States. He works, he works for the Washington Post, as do I. So she was an American. I'd, it'd explain her accent and the way she spoke, freely, as if we were old pals, put me more at ease. What are you writing about? I asked. She laughed, though I hadn't ma meant to be funny. The Egyptian dig, of course. Howard Carter's itching closer to a big discovery. Is there any other news worth considering? My heart sank. No, there probably wasn't. Do you think they'll find the tomb this time? Apparently, Mr Carter has narrowed down the search to a particular spot in the valley, she confided. Words has it they're days from a discovery. I gulped. Really? This wasn't good news at all. If Mr Carter digging had triggered off the curse, like I'd uh, supposed, then I didn't have long to get the jar back to Egypt before Grandad's bad luck and health took a further turn for the worst. Mrs Mendoza was looking equally unhappy. Journalists from all over the world are being sent to Egypt to cover the story. I begged my editor to send me. Begged, she gritted her teeth. But he chose Mr Richards as usual, and now he's had a motor car incident in Italy. Crumbs. Oh, he's only broken a leg and banged his head, she bettered away my concern. The point is, Mr Pemberton is now another reporter, is now sending another reporter to replace him. Why not you? Reporting on the discovery of a lost pharaoh tomb, she scoffed. The biggest news story since the end of the war. Why, that's a job for a man. What tosh, I burst out. Mrs Mendoza eyed me up with what I hoped was respect. You took the words right out of my mouth. Tulip returned with Oz, who sank into the chair furthest away from us. The tea arrived ne next, plates of hot buttered crumpets, lemon cake, uh, tiny meringues. I took two of everything, at which Tulip was shocked, then, then made flapping gestures as I ate. She was, I soon realised, trying to hurry me up. It was a shame to bolt down such uh, bolt down a top tea, but this was obvious, the sign I'd been told to look out for. Let's fetch your satchel, Lil, Tulip said in a bright voice. Oz, you can come too. Oz leapt from his chair. I glanced longingly at my crumpets and all the cake I'd not yet tried, but the glare Tulip gave me uh, put my plates aside. We went across the hall to the library. It was amazing that Tulip's house had a room just for books. There were pictures on the wall in here too, though mostly the same person, a boy with hair that seemed to be constantly falling into his eyes. Is that Alex, your brother? I asked. Even though he was blonde and pale-skinned, he looked familiar. A bit like Tulip, I suppose. She chewed her lips, suddenly serious. It is. He went to France in August 1918 and never came home. I felt awful for mentioning him. Gosh, um, I'm sorry. It's all right, Tulip uh, jested at the silver cups on the shelves. The sort, pe the sort people got uh, at school for sports or writing clever essays. Alex was one of those super brilliant people who won absolutely everything though his luck didn't last forever. Oz had started tapping his fingers against his knee in, uh, in frustration. Tulip seemed keen to change the subject, handed me my satchel, which had been ha hanging from a chair. I didn't mean to look inside, she said, a bit shamed, a bit shamefaced. I didn't even realise it wasn't mine until, until last night, but I couldn't sleep with it in my room, not with that jar inside. It really spooked me. I was glad I wasn't the only one who'd felt this though being reminded of it made me feel uneasy too. I think it's cursed, I admitted. Tulip shuddered. Crikey, how gripping. Believe me, it's not, I said. My granddad's poorly in hospital, and if he's going to get better, then I've got to return the jar where it belongs. I explained about my granddad and Professor Hanawati being in Egypt together. 
My granddad never uh, never wanted to bring the jar back to England, but the professor did, and realised too, too late that it was curse. Death shall come on swift wings to anyone who disturbs the grave of a pharaoh, Tulip said in a dramatic voice. Is that a proper saying? I asked, because I'd not heard it before. Tulip nod, nodded. Someone found it, engraved on a stone, very near where Mr Carter was digging. Mama told me. It sounded unnervingly close to what had happened to the professor and made me shiver. Oz, meanwhile, was getting impatient. Can we please talk about the jar? He begged, sleeves rolled up like he was about to start some sort of task. I've inspected it. The stopper is an Anubis head. The animal f uh, form is meant to be that of a, jack a jackal, commonly found in the desert where the dead would have been buried. Tulip winked at me. I should have warned you, Lil. When my brother gets his teeth into a subject, he becomes a walking encyclopedia. Professor Hanorati reckoned it was a Kenobic jar, I said. Looks like one, Oz agreed. Aren't those what they put in put the dead person's lungs, liver and bits or and pieces into? Tulip asked, pulling a face. It is, I said. But this jar had a scroll inside, not innards. Can we see? Tulip peered over my shoulder. I open it, Oz. That jackal-headed uh, part looks like it's a lid. Just as I'd done, Oz tried to open it. Watching him twist and pull it made me jumpy, though, uh, though, and in the end I had to take it from him because I was terrified he'd break it. The lid won't budge. I've tried. Honest, I have. Is the scroll still in there? Juliet wants to know. I don't think so, I said. Professor Hanawati was translating it when he died. I wonder what he said, Tulip sighed. We should read it, Oz agreed. It might tell us who the jar belongs to. I took a deep breath. Actually, I have read it. Well, the first part of it. He sent the translation to my granddad with a letter explaining about the curse. And? Tulip raised an eyebrow. Was I right to quote that phrase? Is it from the grave of a pharaoh? I looked at Tulip, at Oz. I had to tell them. It's about the last days of Tutankhamun by a girl he, who actually knew him. She calls him Kai Kai. He was best friends with her brother. Tulip blinked. Oz seemed to hold his breath. You could have heard a spider walk across the room. The amazed look on their faces reminded me, as if I needed it, of the hugeness of what I'd found. This is a really big discovery, isn't it? I said, aware of the watery sensation in my stomach. You could say that, Tulip half laughed, half gas. And you've got to send the jar back to Egypt. I nodded, to a hotel called Winter Palace, where Mr Ibrahim will take care of it. You can't post something this valuable to Egypt, Oz looked horrified. You've got to take it to the British Museum. It doesn't belong there, Tulip tried to explain. Professor Hanawati bought it to England by mistake. Lil just said so. But it should be on display where people can see it, he persisted. In Egypt, maybe, but not here, I argued. Actually, I didn't think it should be in any museums anywhere. That's why it has a curse. The jar's rightful place is back in Egypt, in Kai Kai's tomb, I explained very firmly. And that's where it has to go, otherwise my granddad will probably die. I don't think you should post it, Oz mumbled. This was getting frustrating. Look, the Winter Palace is a smart hotel in Luxor, Tulip said. But I have to say, I've never heard of a Mr Ibrahim. I frowned. How do you know all this? It's the hotel where all the reporters are covering Mr Carter's story, are, are staying. I've seen the address on telegraphs Mama sends. If only your mum was going there now, I sighed. Then we could ask her to take the jar. But Mr Pemberton sending another reporter... Oz reminded us. Tulip had to point out. Uh, Tulip had a point about Mr. Ibrahim too. We couldn't rely on him to still be working at the Winter Palace. It was over twenty years ago that Grandad was there. He'd also said that he really understands Egypt. You have to see it for yourself. Your mum should go anyway. I said, thinking out loud, just to prove her editor wrong and show him how good a writer she is. It only meant. I'd only meant it as a throwaway comment. But Tulip jumped on it straight away. Crikey, you're right! If she went, 
uh, she'd insist on taking us with her. What if we faked a telegram from her editor, I said, warming to the idea. What if we made her think he'd changed his mind and sent her instead? There'd be trains to book, hotels to organise, and we were just a bunch of kids. I didn't know if we could pull it off or how quickly. Tulip's eye uh, uh, narrowed her eyes. It was, I was learning, her thinking look. You'd come with us, wouldn't you? I almost laughed. Me? I'd love to, but my parents couldn't afford it. I'd have to trust you two. What if someone else were to pay for your tickets? Sadly, I shook my head. It wasn't just the money. Apart from the day trip to uh, South End, I'd never been outside of London. Egypt was the stuff of dreams, the stuff of Grandad, who'd always been the adventurous one in our family. My parents weren't like that. They worked hard, kept our rooms tidy, cooked a roast on Sundays. If Mum couldn't get a cheap cut of meat... That was their life. It was my life too. And it was far better than some. To wish for anything different felt ungrateful somehow. Anyway, Dad would never let me miss a week off school and Mum would worry for all of England that I'd catch malaria or some other nasty illness. No, the closest I'd get to going to Egypt was hearing Grandad's stories on a Saturday afternoon over a glass of chai. I'm sorry, I said finally. It's impossible. I have to do what I can here in England. After much debate, I was given the job of sending the telegram that would summon Mrs Mendoza to England, uh, to Egypt, sorry. And I'll pretend to be from the Washington Post and book the tickets, Tulip declared. I'll do it over the telephone in my best grown-up voice, then fetch, uh, fetch them from the travel agents in person. You can do all that? I was amazed. Do I look so worried? Mama often asks me to call, for, uh, call them for her if she's rushed off somewhere. It's very easy, I promise you. And I bet it was for her. She had a way of just opening her mouth and the right words came out in a proper order. Not to mention the charming, easy smile. So like her mother's, that probably won people over before she even spoke. With Tulip on board, I began to believe this crazy plan of ours might be possible. All right, I said with a nervous gulp. Let's give it a try. Okay, that is the end of chapter six. Try and answer your guided reading questions. See you soon.